last session, last message in this series. And I'll tell you, tonight, this will very likely be exactly what each and every one of us are in need of. All right, this is going to be the most encouraging message that you never wanted to hear. All right, it's going to be the most encouraging message that I promise you, you never thought like, wow, I want to hear a message on this subject. Because I'll tell you, in other words, there's going to be some really good news that I'm going to give you, but there's also going to be some really bad news that I'm going to give you, which is why this is the most encouraging message that I promise you never wanted to hear. And I promise that, but Jesus promised us a lot of things in this world and in his word also. So before I tell you what he promised, let me tell you what he didn't promise. He never promised us that you would always make straight A's in every class. He never promised you it wouldn't rain on your vacation. He never said you wouldn't get headaches. He never said your car wouldn't break down and leave you stranded. Jesus never promised you that. He never promised that every single one of us would grow up and live in the mansion and be rich. He never promised that your crush would always like you back and you'd live happily ever after with the perfect little family. He never promised us that our football team would win every single championship. I know that one all too well as an Auburn fan. <laughs> he never promised us people wouldn't talk about us behind our back. He never promised us that people wouldn't criticize us. He never promised us that people wouldn't hate us. He never promised people would never be mean to us. He never promised us anything like that. And perhaps that is why this is going to be the most encouraging message that you never wanted to hear. Because this is what Jesus promised us. This is John 15, verses 18 and 20. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me First, verse 20 says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Those are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If the world hates you, if people are mean to you, if you feel persecuted, left out, betrayed, made fun of, keep in mind that it hated me First, the sinless son of God who did no wrong, deserved no hate, was hated all the same. If they persecuted him, they will persecute you. Also, you will have trials. You will have pain. Jesus made sure we understood that. But what I can also tell you is that if you look like this world, if you are not different, the world will love you as its own. Because you go along with everything that it says. You do everything everyone else living apart from Christ is doing. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you will be set apart, you will be different, and you will not look like everyone else. And because of that, there will be people who criticize you. There will be people who make fun of you. There will be people who do not like you. And when you can't find comfort in your persecution, know that Jesus <coughs> promised us that if you follow him, you will be persecuted because so was he. So let that be your comfort in your persecution, in your pain, that you are sharing in the experiences of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went through the same very thing of being hated, being persecuted. We're studying through the book of 1 Peter. And I want to give you guys some more context for our study. And we're going to go over some of the stuff we've already looked at. Because I know that some of you have probably slept through some of these early morning sessions. And you might have missed some of this. So now that we're all fully awake, fully engaged, I'm going to tell it to you again. Because I want it to be fresh on your mind for this message. Peter was writing to a group of Gentile Christians who were under severe persecution. Severe persecution from an evil king named Nero. Now, history tells us Nero killed his own mom. We've talked about that and we know that seems like it's about as bad as it gets. But he also 
not only killed his mom, but he killed his first wife, Octavia, and most historians believe he also killed his second wife. This was a very, very evil man, and again, most historians believe he also, like we've said, burned his entire city, the city of Rome, to the ground because he had this desire to build. And when they wouldn't let him build, he burned it to the ground, so he had to. And when, when he got criticized, he started blaming Christians for doing this. That opened up another can of worms that we've looked at because he took this already persecuted group of first century Jesus followers and put them under even more extreme persecution. More extreme than you and I can even get our minds around. And that's the theme of tonight's message. It's the idea of persecution. Execution that Jesus followers receive when we are just that, when we are following Jesus. In fact, I did some research on this in the past few weeks leading up to this, and I came across a couple different articles. All right, and the authors believe that this last decade of our time, right, this current age that we're living in, has actually been the worst season of persecution. <laughs> in the history of Christianity, right? And there can be some debate on that because we've seen what these people have gone through, but numbers lend towards this being one of the most persecuted times in Christianity. And if you don't believe me, let me show you some stats about what is going on around the world today at this very moment as we sit in this air-conditioned building studying God's word safely. On average, Today, this month, if it's a normal month, there will be about 416 Christians killed somewhere in the world for their faith. About 416 this month. That's almost 5,000 this year. So come December, end of December, when we're all celebrating at our New Year's Eve lock-in, from that point to the one we just had, there's been about 5,000 Christians killed for their faith. At the same time, there will be almost 15,000 Christian churches or organizations that have had their properties destroyed or attacked this year for what they are preaching and teaching within those walls. And along with the 416 killed every month, there's also about another 700 people who will suffer acts of violence, being beatings, tortures, imprisons, rape for their faith. About another 700 tacked onto the 416 that get killed every month. Somewhere in the world today, that is happening as we sit here. So what does this persecution look like? Well, obviously it depends on where you live. Because in some parts of the world, you might lose your family. But in another part of this world, maybe you lose your friend group. In one part of the world, you might be arrested and beaten. And in another part of the world, you might not be invited to the party. No matter what it looks like, it is all persecution. When we suffer in any way for our faith, it is persecution. So I don't say that to make you feel like your persecution is not valid, because it is. It is persecution to you, and that is the life that you are walking. But let it be an example for you to almost thank God for the persecution you get to walk through compared to the persecution others are facing. But persecution nonetheless, because the pain we feel from that persecution is just as real. No matter what it looks like, it is all persecution when we suffer for our faith. And so tonight... What we're going to talk about is how we can have a different perspective in our persecution. How when we face this persecution, you and I can have a different outlook on it. And so if you're ready for our last session, you're ready for the most encouraging message you never wanted to hear. After all of that, let me hear you say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Would 
try it again. I need you to be ready for it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Good. I need you guys as excited as I am for this. Because this is the most encouraging message you never wanted to hear. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, this is what Peter said. He said, dear friends, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Don't be taken aback. Don't be alarmed. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised if when you're faithfully following Jesus, if you're different, if you're set apart, don't be surprised when you face opposition. He says, don't be surprised as if this was unexpected because Jesus told us this was going to happen. Let me explain this verse to you this way. Imagine this. All right, everyone in this room, no matter your athletic ability, we are all right now in this moment basketball players. I need you with me on this. You're on one team. Every one of you is the biggest team ever put together, but you're all on one team. One team of basketball players, elite level. You're on one team, and the other team is over here. You can't see them, but they're over here. And there's one kid sitting over on the bench. He still got his warm-up on. The game started. Still got the warm-up on. He's not really paying attention. He's kind of like maybe he's even on his phone because he snuck it in his like warm-up pocket. Or either he's got a water bottle, but he's like flipping it on the ground, like playing, not paying attention. Maybe he's leaned back, like flirting with cheerleaders behind him, not engaged with the game at all. You over there on that team, your opponent, do you worry about this guy? No. Thank you. Do you worry about this guy? No. No, not at all. Right? You're not at all worried about that guy. But let's say that guy stops water bottle flipping. He puts his phone down. He takes off the warm-up and comes off the bench. And believe it or not, that guy was their secret weapon, and they weren't playing him yet because they weren't worried about you. So this guy gets out there and he's got game. Suddenly he's a threat. So now you, the opponent, are you concerned with him now? And the answer, because some of you may still be like, nah, I still ain't worried. I know I got this. The answer is yes, you are. Let me tell you, the same thing is true when it comes to spiritual things. Follow this with me. If you, as a Jesus follower, are essentially spiritually on the bench, In other words, you may be coming to church every now and then, but you're not engaged. You may come to fall retreat, but you're not locked in. You're doing your own thing up here. You're not praying big prayers. You're not believing in God for his miraculous power. You're not giving generously. You're not serving. You're not using your gifts. You're not sharing your faith. You believe you're on the team, but you're simply on the bench. Do you think your spiritual enemy is really concerned with you? Probably not a lot. But the moment you take off that warm-up suit, you get in the game, you start using your gifts, you start sharing the testimony, the good news of Jesus Christ, you get engaged, you start making a difference, you start worshiping, you start praying, you're using what you have to make a difference in this world. Do you think the enemy is going to take notice? Yes. Don't be surprised. If you start living boldly for Jesus, if that is the moment your spiritual enemy starts to notice you, that's just kind of how it goes. You can coast through life, take the easy way. You won't face much opposition because you're exactly where the enemy wants you to be. But the moment you start facing trial, facing persecution, it's because your enemy is taking notice and they're doing everything in their power to take you down, trip you up, and make you quit. So don't be upset if someone criticizes you, if someone makes fun of you, if something goes wrong when you feel like you're doing everything right. Because that's the moment your enemy has taken notice and says, hey, there's someone that wasn't on our radar, wasn't on the scouting report, and they're bringing light into this dark world, and I can't have that kind of light, that kind of power, because I know the power that they possess. It'd be a little bit like a soldier going into battle and running back into his commander and be like, bro, they're firing at me. Like, they got guns over there. There's bullets flying. I didn't know this was going to happen. 
We need to understand Christianity is not a playground. It is a battleground. We do not battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this dark world. And so if you're engaged, you're serving Jesus faithfully. Don't be surprised when you face opposition. And that's what Peter says. Don't be surprised at these fiery trials that you're facing. <coughs> and he says, fiery trials. And very likely, Peter was not being metaphorical. He was being quite literal. Right? Because if we continue to unpack the reasons on top of many that Nero was a very evil, twisted man, we've talked about the ways he persecuted and tortured Christians. Right? We talked about how he would take animal skins and put them on almost as a coat on these Christians. Put them inside a cage and release this like wild pack of dogs to attack and maul these Christians while he sits back and is entertained. How he would take them and dip them in hot wax and hang them on a tree to light up the night sky as he parties. Essentially making them a living candle. And so when Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're facing, understand it was literally that. They were literally facing fiery trials. It was very likely they knew someone. Their third cousin was just burned as a candle. And he's still saying, don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Because just like Jesus taught, if you follow him, you will be persecuted. I can imagine if Peter were writing this message today, he would contextualize it to this audience. Right? If he was writing to a Jesus follower in the Middle East, he might say, hey, don't be surprised if some of your family members are beheaded for following Christ. If you were writing to a Christian, maybe in a Muslim country, you might be saying, like, hey, don't be surprised if your entire family turns on you, disowns you, kicks you out of your house, never speaks to you again for following Christ. If he's writing to a girl in high school in America, he might say, don't be surprised if you're not invited on a second date because of the stance you took on purity because it's different from a, what a lot of people would expect. If he was talking to a lot of you, he might say, hey, don't be surprised if people make fun of you at lunch. If you don't get invited to the party, if you start getting left out of things because you're involved at church and you're serving Jesus faithfully. And to the first century Christians being persecuted, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are facing. Then he says this, and this is the most encouraging message I told you. It's the most encouraging message that you never, ever wanted to hear. 1 Peter chapter 4 goes on, verse 12. He says, instead, be very glad. And you may be thinking, the nerve on this guy. He says, be very glad. Rejoice. Thank God when you're being persecuted. Be very glad. These trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. You have the honor of suffering. You have the honor of being persecuted the same way, in the same manner as the one who suffered for you. So be very glad for these trials because they make you partners with your Savior in suffering. You want to walk through this life with Jesus, understand the kind of life that he walked, understand what you're signing up for. Because it is a life of persecution, it is a life of pain. He finishes by saying, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. And now for some of you, right now probably a small percentage you may be saying, man, this is really speaking to me right now. Because I've been criticized recently. I've been persecuted for my faith. But chances are there's some of you going, man, honestly, last night's message was kind of more of it for me. Like maybe, maybe next Wednesday at church it'll relate to me. Because I haven't really been persecuted a lot. Maybe that's where some of you are, where this 
like you get it, but it doesn't really relate to you because you haven't really experienced much persecution. And that's a fair place to start our discussion. But why is it that oftentimes we don't face a lot of spiritual conflict? I'll tell you what I think it is. So many of us, we basically become seeking above all else our comfort. We're seeking ease. We're seeking pleasure. And we may not say that. We may not say that those are the things we're seeking. But let's be honest. I'd much rather have a nice, friendly conversation with you than have a confrontational conversation. I'd rather have an easy day than a difficult day. I'd rather, you know, say, hey, praise God for all the good blessings in my life than have to praise God for my suffering and persecution. And that is just kind of our human nature. And so because of our human nature, I think a lot of us would prefer if we could choose comfort, ease, pleasure. That's our preference. And because that's our preference, oftentimes we'll do whatever we can to avoid confrontation, to avoid trial, to avoid struggles. So how might it play out in your world? You're at a party, what do you do? You're gonna smoke, you're gonna drink whatever they're smoking and drinking because you want to fit in. You don't want anybody making fun of you for your faith. You want comfort, you want ease. And so you do, you go along with what everybody else is doing. So you can just kind of blend in. Or maybe you're in class, you're at lunch, you're in the locker room and you start laughing at a joke, you start laughing at somebody else's expense because somebody else is just letting them have it. And you laugh. Maybe you aren't the one speaking it, but you don't do anything to stop it. You just kind of laugh because maybe it's nice to see somebody else on the receiving end for a change. And deep down, you know that it is wrong, 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 wrong. But you think, I don't want to face any persecution if I stand up for somebody and say, man, hey, you should not ever speak to someone like that. You shouldn't say stuff like that. And so maybe you just kind of keep your faith quiet. You push that back down. And you know, if someone asks, maybe you'll tell them about your faith. But it's just so much easier for us not to face that tension, not to face that confrontation of letting it be known what I stand for, what I'm committed to, which is following Christ. Why? Because deep down, we are all the same. We want comfort. We want ease. We want pleasure. The problem is this, though. When we pursue these things, what happens is we never tend to get what we want. We're never satisfied. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to show you two little cycles that tend to happen in our life. Let me show you the first cycle. And you can jot these down in your notes. You're going to go through these in your family groups as well. You know, it begins like this. Innocently enough, without any impure motive, you start desiring to pursue comfort. And once we've pursued comfort, then what do we need to do? If I'm going to be comfortable, then I need to avoid opposition. So if I want to pursue my comfort, I've got to avoid some opposition to be comfortable. So I don't want to do anything that's going to rile anybody up, bring any criticism on me, make my life more dis difficult, because I want comfort. So we're pursuing comfort, avoiding opposition, and then what happens? Our faith tends to weaken. Our faith begins to weaken. Our spiritual muscles begin to atrophy. And so what happens then? As our faith weakens, we're pursuing comfort, avoiding opposition, all the while getting further and further away from God, we end up with a very empty life. My life is empty, has no meaning. And so what do I do? I want more. I've got to have things. I've got to have meaning. I've got to have purpose in relationships. So therefore, the cycle continues. 
And when our life is empty, we begin pursuing comfort. And we avoid opposition. And our faith weakens and our life is still empty because it's a cycle. The cycle continues in our life. And if I can be honest, and if many of you can sit out there and be honest tonight too, you might say, you might not really like to say it, but you might say, that's kind of where I live. That's kind of been my life for the last few months, last few years. Maybe that's always been my life. Pursuing comfort, things I think will make me happy, trying to stay away from opposition, and yet I feel like God is not really present in my life. My life feels empty, and yet you continue to pursue your own comfort. On the other hand, Peter is telling these first century Christians, you are called to be holy as God is holy. You are called to be set apart. This world is not your home because you belong to a heavenly king. You're a heavenly being, and it is his standards and the world's standards, and they are very different from one another. And when you are faithfully following Jesus, it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, suddenly people are going to start criticizing you. You're going to start facing opposition, and then it builds something in you, and you recognize, oh my gosh, I'm doing something right. And it begins to strengthen you, and you enter into this second cycle. And it starts to look more like this. Instead of pursuing comfort, avoiding opposition, having your faith weakened and your life empty, you begin to live boldly for Christ. You follow his teachings. You live according to his ways. But what did he promise? When you do, when you live boldly, you will still face opposition. Oh my gosh, I've been criticized. Oh my gosh, I'm in an uncomfortable spot. What am I going to do? Am I going to avoid opposition? Or will I face this opposition? I don't necessarily know what to say, so I've now got to trust that God will give me the words to say, the strength to stand, the courage and the boldness to stand. And if you do that, because you're living boldly, your faith starts to strengthen and you come out the other side of that opposition and say, man, God came through for me. I feel closer to him now. There's something happening on the inside of me. I can feel the blessings from obedience. I can feel God's power at work within me because I'm living boldly. I faced opposition, but I didn't give in. My faith is strengthened. And as your faith strengthens, you do not have an empty life, but you begin to be closer to Christ. And so now, since he's with you, and you're closer to Christ, the cycle continues on this side as well, and you continue to live boldly. You continue to face opposition, but you persevere through it, and your faith strengthens, and you get even closer to Christ. And this cycle begins to continue, and your life begins to change because you're getting closer and closer to Christ. The opposition's not going away. You're just facing it head on and persevering through it. And so I want to ask you, which one of those two best represents your last week? Let's just look at this moment, your last six, seven days. Which one best represents you? Were you the one, you know, you were trying your best to be happy, to have a good time. Let's not make anybody mad. Let's all live at peace. Let me not stir the pot up. And now your faith just doesn't really seem like much. Life has been kind of empty. And you think, man, maybe there's something more than this. Or maybe there was a time when you stood up for your faith. You said, I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm standing for what's right. I'm standing for Christ. And you did sense a little bit of tension. You face a little bit of opposition, but instead of letting it discourage you, it kind of made you think to yourself, man, I can do this. I just stood up for Christ, and your faith gets stronger. And you begin praying a little bit more dangerously. You pray a little bit more bold, a little bit bigger, and it did something to you because now you're closer to Christ. And now you're ready to worship and follow him and live all the more boldly. 
because you realize that my light is beginning to shine into the darkness. Which one would you say best represents you? Peter goes on to say this. This is one of my favorite verses in maybe this whole book. 1 Peter 4, verse 19. He says, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to God who created you. For he will never fail you. If you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Trust your lives to God, the one who created you, for he will never fail you. I could read this over and over and over again. Right? Keep on doing what is right. Continue to obey him. Trust your lives to him because he will never fail you. I want to share with you guys a principle that I believe is going to speak to somebody because you have got a decision to make. And I'll tell you, this is what I try my best to live by in every area of my life. I do not always get it right. But this is what I try to live by, this principle. And this is what it is. Do what is right and trust God with the results. Do what is right and trust God with the results. That's what this verse says. Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God because he will never fail you. Do what is right and trust God with the results. Control what you can control. And what you control is you. Your life, your spiritual growth, your choices, your decisions, your actions, your words. You do what is right and you trust God with the results. And so what are you going to do? If you sign up for this, you're going to do what's right at school. And you're going to trust God with the results. You're going to do what's right amongst your teammates in the locker room. And you're going to trust God with the results. You're going to do what's right in your family. And you're going to trust God with the results. You're going to trust God in your relationship. And you're going to give him the glory and trust him with the results. You're going to do what's right in every conversation and trust God with the result. You're going to do what's right with the person who wronged you and trust God with the results. I hope this is speaking to somebody tonight. You've got to do what is right and trust God with the results. Do what's right. Trust God with the results. And if I can reread that verse we just read, but you keep on doing what is right. Trust God with the results. He created you. He will never fail you. Do what's right. Trust God with the results. Sometimes it's easy for us to fear what's going on in this world. To fear what's going on around us. And people have asked me, do you ever worry that the world seems to be getting darker and darker and further and further away from God? And as a result, maybe we as a country become more persecuted. We as Christians become more persecuted in our own country. Maybe our persecution begins to look a little bit more like those in more dangerous areas of the world. But I'll be honest, I don't worry about that at all. Not at all. Why? Because persecution never weakens the church. You may be saying, Max, you just told us like 15,000 churches every year got destroyed. I'd say it weakened it pretty good. Persecution never weakens the church because the church is not a building. A church is a body of believers. And so pers persecution doesn't weaken the church. No, persecution strengthens the body of Christ because we begin walking through the same things that Jesus walked through. 
In fact, I think a little bit of persecution may not be a bad thing. Because maybe for some of us, we've begun living in a very comfortable society where there's not much at risk for my faith. We live where it's pretty easy to claim Christ and be a Christian. And so because of that, I think there's a lot of people who have started claiming it and not living it. So a little persecution might actually cause you to make a choice. Am I really a follower of Christ? Is that really what I believe and am choosing to follow in my heart with my life? Am I going to live this out or am I just claiming it? And a little persecution's come, so I'm going to back off. A little persecution wouldn't be a bad thing. In fact, it would strengthen the church. And I believe with all my heart, our roots would grow deeper. And suddenly the light of the church of Jesus Christ would shine even brighter. Because these lights, like this screen, looks pretty bright right now because it's pretty dark. But if we brought the lights all the way up, it wouldn't be as bright. But the darker the world around you is, the brighter your light shines. So a little persecution might not be a bad thing. It might just make our light shine even brighter into a lost and broken world. I want us to look at those cycles again. Which one represents you? I'm pursuing comfort, avoiding opposition. My faith is weakened. My life feels empty. Or can you truly say, I'm living boldly? I feel I'm facing opposition, but my faith is not weakening. My faith is strengthening through that trial, through that opposition. And because of that, I'm growing closer to Christ. Which one is it for you? I love the heart of this next passage of Scripture we're going to look at in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 5, look at what he says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You may be thinking so far, what does this have to do with anything we've talked about? Follow with me. Verse 5, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But he continues, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Then, here's where it all connects. Verse 7, he says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Give all your worries, all your cares to God because he cares about you. When he says give, give all your worries and cares to God, give, another translation says cast, right? Cast your worries, cast your cares on God because he cares for you. The Greek word there for cast or give is actually a, a fishing term. That's why Peter the fisherman was very familiar with it. The fishermen would cast their nets on the water. They would take them, throw them out of the boat. They would cast their nets. And Peter is saying this. He says, you take what's burdening you and you throw it upon God. You take it off you, you take it out your boat, and you throw it and put it on God. You cast your cares, you cast your worries on God. If you're worried about school, you do what's right and you trust God with the results, you cast it on Him. If you're worried about a health situation in your family, you pray, you be faithful, you do what's right and you cast that situation on God and trust Him with the results. You do what's right. You give it to God. Not because you just can't handle it, but because He cares for you and He is more than able to do abundantly more than we can think, fathom, or imagine. You do what's right and you give it to God. You cast it on Him. 
Then Peter goes on to say this. This is so powerful. He says, give your cares to God. Cast your cares because he cares for you. Then he says this. Listen to the comfort that he gives in 1 Peter 5.11. He says, so after you have suffered a little while. If we just stop right there and look at that. Suffered a little while. So for those of you who are suffering right now, you are hurting right now. Understand, it will not last forever. The pain you feel now will not last forever. The trial you're facing now will not last forever. So if you've suffered for a little while, what will our God do? Our God will restore. Our God will support. Our God will strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation, all power to him forever. Amen. So after you've suffered for a little while, look at what our God will do. He will restore you. Restore means to make even better than new. He will support you when you are weak. He will strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. So for whoever in here is hurting, whoever in here is discouraged, whoever suffered setback after setback after setback, you remember, after you have suffered for a little while, what will our God do? He will restore you. He will support you. He will strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. And that firm foundation is the rock of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, no matter what you go through, all praise goes to him. Because our God is always good. Our God will never fail you. No, our God cares for you. So let me ask you very, very simply. For those of you that are followers of Christ, if you find yourself a little bit more like that first cycle, if you're really honest with yourself, you've been pursuing comfort, avoiding conflict, really maybe not having a strong and a growing faith, and your life feels a little bit empty tonight, maybe it's been going on for months, maybe even years, let me propose to you a different way. God is calling you to be different, to be set apart, to live boldly for Jesus. But to understand, when you do, Jesus promised it, Peter experienced it, listen, you will face opposition. It's part of it. Because you are in a spiritual battle, so I can promise you it's going to happen. But in the middle of that opposition, here's what's also going to happen. God is going to use you, and your faith is going to strengthen, and you're going to grow closer to Christ because of it. And suddenly, you're going to realize, I am called. I am set apart. I am chosen by God. I am a royal priest to the holy nation, a people belonging to God, and he is calling me to let his light shine into this world. So for those who say, I want that light to get brighter, I want to live bolder, I'm asking you to pray that big prayer of faith tonight. Pray that you would be a person of his word. That you wouldn't just commit to it here, but you would go home and you would read his word over and over and over again. You would allow it to speak to you and move you and encourage you and empower you to live boldly for Jesus. And there are those of you who will take that bold step of faith this week. Taking that step that maybe you've never taken before. To stop hiding that light and to begin letting it shine brightly because of who your God is. Because of who Jesus is. And because of what he did for us. You want to show his love. You want to shine that light into this dark world. The first time we face a little bit of opposition, rather than being discouraged, pray tonight that may God allow us to be encouraged. May God give us the strength to feel encouraged, to be very glad, and to have the perspective to understand that we are sharing in this partnership with Jesus, suffering in a small way as he suffered. And at the same time, God is using it all to strengthen our faith, to make us even bolder. 
There's those of you who are hurting, and I don't want to disregard that hurt. You may be facing very significant pain, very significant trials. Ask God that just as Peter said, he would give you the strength to cast those cares on him because he cares for you. And we can thank God that after we have suffered for a little while, he is faithful to restore us, support us, strengthen us, place us on that firm foundation, the rock of Jesus Christ. We can look to God and trust in him. And there's those of you tonight who are going to recognize I am not following Christ. I've been pursuing comfort. I've been hiding that light because maybe that light hasn't ever really even been turned on. Maybe I thought it was. Maybe I wanted to think it was. Maybe I wanted to tell myself it was. But in reality, I've been living a completely different life. And there's no light in me. You've been called by God. You've been calling yourself a Christian for years. But maybe tonight you start to realize you're not. Because you can call yourself a duck, but you can't fly. You're not a duck. Some of you may say, I'm a Christian. You're not. Others of you, in this moment, you can feel yourself being drawn to the things of God. What is that? What's that draw? What's that feeling in your chest right now? It's the love of God. It's the power of His Spirit. You're not here by accident. You're not here by mistake. You're here because God loves you. You're here because God wants to draw you to Himself. And you recognize, I'm not following Christ. I'm sinful. I need a Savior. I need Jesus. That is every single one of us in this room. We need Jesus. The Son of God who is perfect in every single way. The Lamb of God who is perfect. The perfect sinless, spotless sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins who shed his blood on the cross, died for our sins, and rose from the dead so that anyone, and that includes you, who calls on his name, the very name that is above all names, when you call on the name of Jesus, your sins can be forgiven. And you will never, ever be the same. There are those of you who need that grace. You need to experience that kind of love for the very first time. And you are here now for this very reason to receive new life because when you call on him you become a new person the old is gone and everything becomes new so for those of you who say like yes i need jesus yes i need to turn from my sins i need to turn towards him i need to surrender my life i need to give it to jesus if that is your prayer then please find an adult in this room talk about it address it right now in this moment don't even wait for me to finish Go now, you will not be a distraction. But for those of you who you are following Christ, but you have not been letting that light shine, you take this time and you pray that God will begin giving you a different perspective. Pray that he would open your eyes, open your heart, open your mind, to understand that persecution is an opportunity to let your light shine, to grow your faith. An opportunity for you to share in the life experience of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And maybe you've been shying away from that because you want comfort, you want ease, you want pleasure. You want to have both, you can. You've got to make a choice. So maybe tonight you found yourself kind of walking that line and you need to come before God and say, God, I surrender it to you. I'm casting my cares, my worries, my fears, my anxieties, my depression, everything on you. And I'm going to live boldly for you, knowing that I'll face opposition, but I'm not going to let it discourage me. I'm not going to shy away from it this time. I'm going to face it and I'm going to persevere through it because that is exactly what you have called me to do. 
And because of that, I will be closer to you. Because I'm walking in step with the life of your son. So you pray. You respond. You worship loud and rejoice and praise God for new life that you have experienced. If you're walking that bold life. However the Lord is leading you. You respond in this moment.